it's you. Oh my gosh. You've come a long way, baby. Professionally and personally. I pulled out all your things from the retreats, all the things that you wrote back when I first met you in 2014. It's like a time capsule for doctors who've changed their lives, healing patients and being totally out of the system, real artisans. I so want to share some of these quotes, but I also just want to know your before and after story. I'm going to share this with some other doctors and I just want them to know you don't have to be an obituary. You literally could live your dream. Would you read a couple? What attracted you to this course? But on two of them, you wrote desperation. <laughs> oh, here's another one. Desperation. The other ones were total confusion. That was October 2015. You also wrote Pamela's anti-bullshit attitude. Take us back to the fusion and desperation state. A lot of people hover in that state for way too many years, sometimes a lifetime. It is very hard to identify with all of those old emotions. Protected myself from the kind of abusive and self-denigrating energy. I felt better and better about myself because as I work with my expertise and my passion, I do a beautiful job and my patients thrive and give me loving feedback on a daily basis. You're doing amazing. You're so incredible. Enough years of this and you like can't remember feeling like a piece of shit. Felt like a loser, which is interesting because I at baseline border on little narcissistic. I'm very outspoken. I feel very educated. Even with my baseline, I still was able to feel stupid, unprofessional, imagining people coming from a more self-denigrating place at baseline. I'll never be good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm stupid. I'm, if they actually think that, I mean, there's no hope to not feel like a total piece of shit. It, it makes anyone feel like a total piece of shit. I'm very sensitive and I feel things very strongly and loudly. I am not able to suppress pain and emotions very well. Can't ignore. It. Unethical practices. You are unable to submit to that and to self-abuse. You quit residency, became a real doctor with your own practice. But when you came to me at the retreat, remember you thought you were going to be a pharmaceutical rep peddling drugs out of your back of your car didn't know what else you could possibly do. I had to tap you on the head with my anti-bullshit wand and say, you're amazing. You can do anything you want. You can have your own practice and people will pay you more because you quit residency and you can <laughs> give them the true answers that they're seeking from a very balanced view that's not indoctrinated in any one healing art. The longer you stay in training and then in the system, the more fear builds up internally of uh, reprimands and firings and the board and trouble and lawsuits. And so doctors who have less fear and can act from less fear and more certainty and trust in the feeling of faith, like, oh, I know what the right thing to do is. I'm not living in the medical legal paranoia as much. People line the fuck up to pay cash to see me, it seemed unethical to be focusing on an embarrassingly myopic omeprazole prescription of people who had poor lifestyles because they had emotional problems. I considered going to naturopathic medical school, another four-year postgraduate program. Fortunately, Pamela was able to like catch me like additional degrees are not necessary. Additional experiences are necessary to come back into a sense of trust and confidence in myself. It's really a knee-jerk reaction for people who are used to getting pat on the back by academia as overachieving students that we all are that got us into med school that if we reach a roadblock and we don't know what to do, our knee-jerk reaction is poor diplomas, certificates, and degrees. Look, I, I had these in the closet for a long time, but now that I'm retired, I put them on the wall to prove that I actually did something with my life now that I just sit in the garden and water all day and eat strawberries and help physicians with trauma recovery and read obituaries of the people who didn't make it to the retreat and didn't ask for help. What is the deal with not asking for help? Oh my God. God. And there, you know, it's some, it's because it's sort of like an every man for himself kind of culture that people are falsely like acting like it's okay, falsely acting like they like their job, falsely acting like they feel like they're doing a good job in four and a half minute visits, trying to keep a good face up. Everyone's just like trying to keep a good face up and like mm -hmm. not admitting that their soul is crumbling underneath. And 
their soul is crumbling under the supervision and guidance of other physicians. So that's what leads to this comment, which I've heard a number of times at my retreat. I don't know if you've ever heard this. So this woman comes, I think I know what it is, but I won't out her. She's like, my husband made me. I don't know why I'm here. I don't even, I hate doctors. I don't even like doctors. Can you, isn't that heartbreaking? How self berating is that? To not yeah, like yourself. I was other. fucking terrified of doctors for years, probably until the past two years. And I've been in practice now for six. And I would really not interact with them unless strictly necessary. I only interacted with naturopathic doctors and acupuncturists and other kind of healing professionals. They're, you know, they have medical degrees, chiropractic physicians have a four-year postgraduate medical school, naturopathic physicians have a four-year postgraduate medical school. So they, they were physicians in their own right, but I was like too terrified. Even though I felt good, I could re-educate myself. I could make, I could find who I really was in my career dream. I still was afraid of doctors. Is that because you left your residency and you felt like a failure didn't fit in or something? Or what do you yeah, think? I, I feel like doctors are can be really mean and like instantly denigrating mm-hmm. based on status. Um, some can, it's just, you never know. But what, what do you think is really emotionally creating that? It's cultures of unhappiness. It's just unhappy people. It's just going back to hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. And it's in pushing a- their butthole so hard that they're giving themselves constipation and like making everybody else emotionally constipated too. So I was realized I had to leave my residency because I was not fit to recommend omeprazole for people's emotional problems. And I like could not physically, I couldn't do that. So fortunately I started one, my first of 10 retreats, like as with Pamela, 10, as 10, I went to 10 of Pamela's retreats as I was finishing my only year of residency of family medicine residency. And I was able to put together my first steps of my personal dream, which I like, I, my story is interesting and everything, I guess, but it's not like applicable to other people necessary necessarily. And I still to this day, Pamela, are like you need to do Pamela's intro course, which involves reflection and discussion about what is it that you really want to do if you could do anything, what really lights you up. And people are so disconnected from that that it takes time to like calm the fuck down from feeling like a piece of shit get a little shiny star shined up inside of you again, start dreaming again. It takes time. This is not instantaneous. So, and that process is so unique and everyone wants a different thing and has a different ideal patient and a different ideal clinic. I'm so sad when people just, again, escape the Titanic of assembly line, big box medicine, and then quick put all the working parts together for a clinic, but they skip the personal introspection about what they are at the soul level. So they've just replicated another clinic that is like literally a small box version of the big box that will then keep them a prisoner, which is why I see so many physicians who are like not blissed out (laughs) in their own practice. I had a session recently with a therapist who said, you're the happiest doctor I've ever seen. It was like a medium psychic thing. And she's like, I I can't, you're not a doctor. I can't believe you're more like a teacher or a a therapist, right? You're not a doctor. And I was like, no, I'm a doctor. She's like, I've never seen a doctor as happy as you. She's like, (laughs) and so I think people are skipping the happiness step of like, retrieving their heart and soul that has been slaughtered in reductionist medicine that just severs that at the beginning. And then it has to be retrieved, retouched, refelt through and re-enlivened because it got like put in a sad box and was like, no, no, you're not there. You're not right. You need to be an automaton to meet the metrics of the systems that are using you. And, And you have to act like you're choosing to do it. So it's a very disturbed thing. And, ha- and pretending that that's okay is so at odds with like a real awake person's, I guess, you know, ethics 
that uh, it's it is it's very damaging to like act like it's okay and work in assembly line medicine for yeah. years to decades. So then what people do is sometimes leave assembly line medicine. They put all the little working pieces together of their business bank account and their website and their little, you know, business cards and then they're still not happy. And some of them are bringing in shit money and other people are bringing in really good money and they're still not happy. And you're not happy because you haven't involved yourself, your soul in the process, right? I figured out that I wanted a like holistic medicine mentor and set out to find her with a passion alive in my heart and made some very simple steps like Googling naturopaths, having tea with them, asking them what they did because I didn't know what that was. And we're, oh, and I, I very quickly turned into like a sought after practitioner because there was this model alive in my city that I had no idea existed of little neighborhood naturopathic clinics where people would work independently, collaborate a little bit and have some kind of financial connection or not, depending on how they ran their businesses. And I was suddenly like um, high value because my degree is like fancy and naturopathic degrees were and still are like less fancy. So I went from feeling like a piece of shit to Pamela being the first like injection of like, you're a really smart, nice person. You're going to do good. And literally I was like in this weird family. I have this visceral memory of sitting in circle with you at a smaller earlier retreat at Brighton Bush and being like, if you're, you have you know, when you speak very impassionedly, like it's, it's clear and you use your hand punctuation and you have the way you, I mean, you listen to yourself talk, like it's very unique. And I was in like glued into eye contact with you and was receiving this like light transmission of Pamela's juju around confidence, healing, creating your own dream life and dream clinic. And it like worked. I was like hypnotized by her confidence that this process that we did, which is really well put together, but a process that we did in her retreats would like result in success and joy. So it, it I got hypnotized by this and it ended up playing out fairly seamlessly. And once I realized the world was my oyster, it became like, oh shit, I got to narrow this down. So I kept learning about financial models. And as soon as I learned about the membership model, it like dawned on me that there was no other sane financial model for me. I'm not about to fucking take insurance and spend, oh, I don't know, half of the time of my life that I work do doing insur insurance documentation and like phone calls. Like, are you kidding me? Uh, nor want to be serving the insurance company, which exists only to restrict care. They like pretend that they're delivering care, but obviously they only exist to like save money and restrict care and be working for them, not my patient, very out of alignment. And uh, I also, you know, the model of like just paying per each moment you spend with a patient has some ramifications in the relationship with my patient that I don't like, such as shit, I don't know if I can afford to have another follow-up visit or, or damn it, I better get my money's worth out of this time that we have together or uh, people kind of not following up due to financial reasons. Uh -huh. So the financial model, when they're fucking locked in to like a contract and are paying monthly, regardless of what they use, I we, we are only working with their like motivation and desire to work with me. And I get to spend huge amounts of time with this patient and this patient who have a hospitalization and a mental health breakdown. And we're texting many times a day. We're talking twice a day. They're like in the, and, you know, quiet patients for six months who I can't get a hold of, but send a text or a portal message here and there to, Hey, how you doing? Is your gut still, how, how are your poops? So the, the freedom and the, it, it's like the great equalizers, yeah. the membership. And, and people understand membership because um, 
gym. Back to the gym. Yes, I get it. The financial model started to crystallize. I started to learn all of like the things one must do to like make a business and work slowly towards that and have had several stages of my career that progressed quite organically because of Pamela's I mean, really, I just like absorbed the teachings and she did recommend, she's like, for people who are stressed out, like keep listening to the fucking recordings, just like repeat that shit, like keep listening to the right, get it absorbed where you like things shift and you like outgrow your current dream. It's not static at all because we're, we're like becoming self-actualized people faster than other people because we're like our own boss, our own boss, our own mom, our own dad, our own priest. I mean, everything and our own doctor. And so outgrowing like this mode and that model and this thing, like, so, so I moved from a practice with like the mentor of my dreams who plopped right in my lap as long as soon as I talked to enough people, it was very easy and had a very fulfilling and deep relationship with this woman who has all these doctorates and 25 years of clinical experience in naturopathy and Chinese medicine and has written a bazillion paper. She's just a huge educator. So, so I was like, literally did the model that was prevalent in the early 1900s in medicine, which is one year of internship and then mentorship in the community with people who you select. That is the original model of medical school. Pamela, that's fascinating. And so all this like, um, you know, complaining about not enough not money, Congress, residency slots, you know, slots that are, um, we don't have enough and we don't have enough doctors. It's like, if we went back to the model that you have just pione- re-pioneered, which is <laughs> one year of internship and create your own ideal mentorship scenario, which people are generally willing to do for trade or for free or low cost, definitely a better deal than staying in residency, potentially making more money than the co-residents per hour for sure. But oh, I yeah, think per hour, she was just happy for a motivated learner to be seeing patients in her clinic. I shifted from a beautiful five-year mentorship where my brain got so soaked full of this incredible functional medicine approach to evaluating the underlying body systems and the gut biome and chronic infections and nutrient deficiencies and emotional constructs and how they contributed to like complex mystery illnesses and learn just a lot of herbs and nutrition and fasting through her. And she and I also would started teaching together. So I would like study a topic using her materials. She was, she's been faculty for decades at the naturopathic medical school and the Chinese medical school and using those materials and, um, textbooks. I have all these old textbooks and like put together, um, programs that she and I would put on for naturopaths. So I would teach, I mean, it was like a legitimate multifaceted mentorship that didn't cost any money that generated money for her because I was working in her clinic and generated money for me. So talk about match made in heaven. I think that's probably the way physicians did it a long time ago. Yeah, they just made money and mentored each other as they went. And now what we've done is we've allowed these no value added third parties to intervene to the point where we're just cogs in the wheel. And I actually got this um, boxer message from this doctor who said, my son did the math. If I make $2 million a year for my hospital and work 80 hours a week, which is what she's doing, that's $480 an hour. And I wrote, so how much of that do you get paid per hour? And she said $58, basically something like 80 Eighty-eight percent overhead, which is terrible. And this woman has no time, free time to do anything. She's charting till midnight all weekend long. She's, she's, I think on a 30 hour, um, like her, she's FTE 30 hours, but she says she spends 70 to 80 hours of her own time charting and doing other stuff. I'm just letting you know. Because it's your responsibility. That's what's so fucked up is like- The liability ends up on your head if something goes wrong, right? If you like don't chart correctly, you have to deal with board investigations and they know that. And they're like, <laughs> you deal with that. You, yeah. you deal with that problem. I mean, they are fucking laughing. These people are like, this is 
hysterical of what they've gotten doctors to do. It's very, very bizarre. So I have uh, started taking med students. Oh, yay. Because, they need help. Uh, yeah. And there is no shortage of med students who feel like they don't fit and are not stoked to like go to residency go and to the residency and like start being in clinics where people hate you because you're like taking up their time and they have no time and uh, feel like they want to tell people to eat vegetables and go walking, but instead they have to tell them other stuff. And you know, I got in trouble for passing out a kale salad recipe in residency. I got called in to the like program director person's office because I didn't get approval from the patient education committee. I was a little bit too excited to be like plant-based and it wasn't cool back then. Oh yeah. Gosh. I was bypassing the the bureaucracy. So now I have my own practice mm -hmm. and like eventually the group practice, like they were all her staff and it was like fine for some number of years. And eventually dealing with staff that are not mine, I like didn't have enough control over stuff and it became such a fucking pain in the ass. And the pain in the ass started out like small and grew to be large enough that I was over it and wanted to live in peace and harmony in my own little like crystal studded, you know, like plant covered crystal fern. Uh, look, I have, I got new curiosities. I have little insects on pins and beakers. Very cute. Uh, and not have anyone bother me. I was really tired of anyone bothering me. So now nobody bothers me and I spend a bazillion, like all of my, so I see like one to four. Okay. So I have a, a membership model where I have a relatively small number of members. I think I have 64 members or something. Oh, right that's now. awesome. And what's yeah. the membership fee these days? You increase so, um, to, to like sign up with me, it's $2,200 for the first three months mm -hmm. where I do your intake, which is like long and multiple appointments and put plans together, which are long and multiple appointments do like records reviews and collection from that time you had a brain MRI and the psychiatrist and blah, 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 review all of that, make recommendations, make referrals, do a bunch of labs, interpret them with you and like go over, like, what are we looking at? Blah, blah, blah. And so that's like unlimited care for the first three months and telephone and text and uh, email and whatever and office visits. And then after that, it's 200 bucks a month ongoing with no like long-term contract. We can quit at any time, but nobody ever quits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even if they don't use me, they're like, they want the access because what they get is someone who knows them, who responds directly to them in a timely manner. Shock of all shocks, right? You can't get that. It's like not safe to be have medical problems because you can't get your doctor who knows you to respond to you in a timely manner uh -huh. and who is exceedingly thoughtful and slow. So every little thing that happens, I'm like, well, I think we really need to be doing more with probiotics and prebiotics, like your UTIs, like blah, blah, blah. Well, but I do a lot of like PT motivation because all of my older patients, I'm like, you need some fucking leg strength and balance training. And they never go if you just like write a referral, you have to like, so I, I, I fucking work on people for years to get them in with a physical therapist so that they will have consistent physical therapy that their insurance pays for. So my patients are largely insured. So their insurance pays for their labs and their x-rays and their PT and their gastroenterologist and yep. their colonoscopy. But my work with them is outside of the insurance system. And generally, I have no, generally, I have no problem. So Kaiser doesn't like you to order labs through Kaiser, but everyone else pretty much doesn't have a problem. It's rarely a problem to order labs and blah, 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 and stuff. So, and I bring in nutrition, herbal, whatever, as well as acceptance, because I have a bunch of like extreme COVID paranoid, sorry, COVID vaccine paranoid people who even think, who like think they are like injured from people who are vaccinated anyway. And I don't laugh them out of the office. I don't make them feel bad. And it's not just that one issue. Lots of people with unusual or like whatever, unpopular health beliefs right. can come here and be always have someone be nice to them. My job is to be nice to people, yeah. accepting, 
Oh, well, that's interesting. I haven't heard that before. I'm happy to look over that link for you. Instead yeah. of, you know, I've never heard of that. I don't know what that is. Oh, means. oh my gosh. So I have to bring this up because I just published, I don't know if you saw an article that I spent a week on, on informed consent. The title is, as a doctor, I was trained to violate my patient's rights to informed consent, which I think is Maybe I'll just share a little bit about what happened at residency because I think this will bring back memories, but I want to share about the reason why I bring this, bring this up is that I love when people bring in books and articles and things for me to review because I'm not time constrained like you are not time constrained. You're getting paid for your time. You're not resentful after the visit. And we love the joy of learning. Why would we not want to learn something? Even if uh, we disagree, we can agree to disagree, but we'll give our best opinion. But literally, so this is what happened to me in training. See if you recognize this. Early in training, I was good at getting patients to quickly sign consent forms without reading them. I didn't have time to read them either. I didn't know enough to explain risks or answer questions in these 10 minute visits. Like my peers, I just reassured patients that we were giving them safe stuff, right? And uh, we just needed a signature to inject their IV contrast or give medication. And I, I don't know if you ever remember this, giving Spanish speaking moms multiple consent forms in English. They had to sign on behalf of their children really quick before they got the meds. You know, these people trusted me and I literally was trained to be deceptive. And I think it's just this time constraint issue. And I feel like most residents and physicians can relate to what I'm saying. I don't know. Um, but then you might remember this story. In my final year of training, I was told to prescribe Premarin, pregnant mares, urine derived estrogen to all menopausal women without explaining alternatives or risks. It was just part of healthcare maintenance, like give everyone estrogen fountain of youth. Okay. And I refused to do it. I was reprimanded. I went to the medical library, did my own research rather than rely on drug companies or my training program that my training program I found out received money for their involvement in the Women's Health Initiative study on Premarin and menopausal women. So conflict of interest, which I didn't know until later, but beyond the cruelty of pregnant mares standing in stalls, peeing for humans to get their urine for a bunch of horse estrogens that are not even native to the human body, I discovered that the risks to my patients for which the Premarin study was eventually halted um, and since I had no time in clinic to share drug risks and alternatives, I actually held free pu public library lectures for my patients and community members where I reviewed all the menopausal hormone therapies, including non-drug options and shared simple and comprehensive handouts. So isn't it crazy that I had to go out of my clinic to do informed consent in the public library, okay? Does any of this ring a bell that you weren't able to sort of do your job at work? Ding, 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 ding. yeah. So the thing that like blew me away when you say that you love when patients bring in information from for you, which I would love for all of us to be lifetime learners and really enjoy that aspect of learning from our patients. That's the practice of medicine. We are learning to practice medicine from our very bright, wisdom filled, suffering patients who are teaching us just like in third year medical student as a third year medical student remember how we could spend a lot of time with one patient i don't know if you had that but it's like being a perpetual third year medical student and letting your patients teach you so um you know what i love i love that my patients are very polite about taking my time and a little anxious about needing things from me and I feel relaxed and like I have plenty of time to deal with everything that they need uh -huh. and communicate that to them, you know, with my tone and my words. So they feel, I mean, love. I feel they so feel loved. cared for and yeah. so safe. Uh -huh. And my lifestyle has allowed me to continue my healing journey and become a bastion of physical and emotional wellness through trainings and personal therapy and maintaining exercise regimens and learning about different ways of fitness and caring for the body and mind. So I'm trying out all these things. And what I do is run groups free, of course, like everything's included with my patients on a variety of topics that matter to me. And I know which patients it will matter to as well. So I like recruit them and like make them show up for this group. Some are in person and some are virtual. 
and because I have so much time, I'm not. I, yeah. I mean, how many hours a week do you think you're working? Well, I mean, I work, you know, day hours, whatever, not, 10 to five, nine to four, something like that, Monday through Thursday. But most of it is not sitting in front of a patient. It's like right. responding to patients' issues and messages, right. like, by, you know, going over their UA and deciding what to do about it. Well, um, and writing, like a lot of my patients enjoy writing what's going on with them to me. And I think that's very clear and yeah. I like writing as well. And I'm pretty fast at typing. So we do a lot of writing. I <laughs> quietly write. I love writing. Pamela, I love writing. And a lot uh, of my clinical work uh, is like, yeah. this is what I think is going on. These are the factors I think are influencing it. Uh, a, B, C, D. I can look back and be like, what did we talk about? So a lot of it is like writing beautiful little essays for my patients. And uh, all of this is like me yeah. having found my strengths and my passions, uh -huh. which is important for each person to do. Nobody needs to like emulate me. We need to like realize that we're fairly omnipotent. We're like at the highest range of education level, motivation level, um, even humanistic ability. Physicians generally have a very high level of this as well. And after tra our trauma healing, our ability to deliver ridiculous quality of care in our special vein for our special type of ideal patients is, is fairly infinite. And yeah. You know, for me to have this practice is like three years old and I've jacked up my prices quite a bit and they will only be jacked up more. A woman who does something similar to me. Well, and here's the thing. I, I'm, I'm curious because I, I have plenty of blue collar patients and I've kept them at like the same price. So not all of my patients pay the new, the current price. So you can do that. You can like keep your patients at what they came in paying at and you love them and you've cared for them for five years. And like, I could never price them out in my practice. And you know that they're like poor and then you, the newer ones pay more. So I like keep the spread of a variety rather than like a concierge sort of monoculture. Um, yeah. But there's a doctor locally who does similar work to me and she charges a thousand dollars a month. Um, I revamped my membership. Um, agreement to involve no after hours care guaranteed. Um, I thought by accident that like you had to offer that or something, or I don't know. And finally, a couple of years later, I'm like, what am I doing? I think that's a holdout from the uh, residency situation yeah. in the 24 seven via. Yeah. And they were always kind about it, but I realized that legally I simply needed to state I am not necessarily available, but guess what? I often am available. And when my patients text the office line, I have a great phone system that's HIPAA compliant and I can make texts go to my phone or go to my app or go to my laptop, depending on the time and have all the messages said, it's great. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and my old lady patient who's terrified to go into the ER because of the, uh, because of COVID, how, like I, I got to order her an x-ray. I mean, fuck yeah, I'm answering her after hours and I managed her foot over the weekend. And they're like, the, the gratitude of them, the love, we love you, Dr. Cat. Oh my God. And knowing that she was protected from eight mm. hours of God knows what, God knows what meds they should her up with. She's already on like, she has heart failure. You can't just give those people meds, inappropriate imaging, exposure to goodness knows what in waiting rooms of goodness knows where, um, and just stress. Does and the price, the price of it, the, the cost. And the financial cost, being like, oh, guess how much this cost? Free. Free. I, it's like, I, so, so that's rare, you know, but I, I can be available if I want after right. hours. Right. But if I'm not available, then legally I'm not available. So. Yeah. So what I was going to share is that um, I, I wrote, how can patients get information before consenting to medications or procedures? Before taking a new medicine, read the drug insert online or through pharmacies. Join discussion groups for specific drugs, procedures, and illnesses. Do your research. Medical sites may overemphasize benefits and minimize risks, while injured patients will focus on life-altering adverse effects. For example, radiologists might minimize the IV contrast risk, while a subset of patients who lacked informed consent for MRI gadolinium contrast are in a Facebook support group suffering debilitating effects of gadolinium deposition disease. And so, you know, 
I posted this uh, article and this pharma, pharma rep wrote me. She said, I worked in pharma for many years and learned more about the drugs I promoted through online peer groups than from the pharmaceutical company I worked for. That limited and highly censored info is what reaches physicians and prescribers. The whole system is broken. So it's impossible to actually give informed consent if you only use industry-sponsored conflict of interest material. I don't know if you have anything to say about what it's been like with informed consent over the last few years, but I feel like when you're in the type of practice that is relationship-driven, you know, this monthly fee, like you are all in and patients are highly educated in your practice and there is no lack of informed consent before them making a decision for a test, a drug, a procedure, a medication. Is that true? Yeah. And you know what I've noticed that I've started doing? I, you know, like we have like different minds. Like when I'm someone's doctor, I have a certain mind on. And if I'm like someone's friend, I have a different mind on. And there's this other mind. So I'm like a doctor and like drawing on my medical knowledge, my post residency naturopathic and functional medicine knowledge. And some, so yeah, so what I know, and then I think to myself, yeah, and what would I do if it were me or my mom or my uncle? Mm. Eh, I'd probably, so I actually, I, I usually am like, well, this would be very reasonable. And generally this is what's recommended. If you went to Providence, this is what they would recommend. But like, I'm at, I was like, I'm actually not really into taking drug medications unless I'm like kind of at death's door. So another option would be to blah, 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 and wait or do this, or there's herbs. Blah, blah, blah. So I, that's what I've started doing is share. I realized just naturally that my own two minds of like, what would I do? And what does my medical training do? And I have so much time. Yeah. So much time. Yeah. That there, there's no shortage of their questions are all answered. Right. Um, and we connect. I have gotten so much out of therapy. And one of the magic parts of therapy is that it's a very special, unique relationship with a person who's like professionally, emotionally healthy. And it's perfectly right. safe. You uh -huh. can't be bad or wrong or stupid. Um, they're always there at the right time. Uh -huh. You're like non-abandoned. <laughs> they're like oh, reliability, boundaries, clarity. And they like are working for your higher good. And they're in a, you know, non-fucked up state like all humans are. So as best as they can. Right. That's how I, my time to relate and learn about their lives and be endlessly supportive curious and caring. I'm like, Oh, this is the, this is the, this is the money here. Like this is yeah. the quality that yeah. over this many years, they know that no matter what, I'm not going to be mean to them. I'm not going to look down, talk down to them or get mad at them. So many times they're like, you're going to get mad at me, Dr. Cat, but blankety blank, blank, blank. And I'm like, Oh, please. No, that short of damaging my physical body you can't do anything to make me mad at you. You're in a safe place. You can make all the mistakes you want and we will start fresh. And so, uh, yeah, so it's relationship based is for sure. It's the name of the game. That is beautiful. So if any patients are listening to this, they can find you in Portland, right? Is that where, what, what's your website? I want people to be able to find you. If you're yeah, for this type of doctor, drcatlopez.com, D-R-K-A-T-L-O-P-E-Z.com. Okay. And I spent quite a while with my practice closed with a wait list while I hired an intern who's a naturopathic medical student and an angel. And he's now my patient liaison, office manager, admin assistant. And we hang out in my little crystal office most days of the week or do, or do virtual for a couple of hours. Um, and he's getting to learn along with his medical school what would it be like to run a practice? What are phone systems? Oh, you yeah. can choose a different EMR. How do you order a lab? Yeah. Like, what is what is it yeah. legal? How do you find a psychiatrist? Like, what all the little yeah. things? So he's getting this amazing he, he's residency. Amazing. He's getting a residency from you, basically, and you're getting a really good employee, I guess. And he's getting paid for it. So again, I'm right. like, he's getting the education and getting paid for mm -hmm. it. 
And this should absolutely be the model for medical education right now, unless you want to go into neurosurgery, orthopedic, if, unless you really need a hospital-based tra transplant surgery residency, if you're trying to do outpatient holistic care, there is absolutely no reason to be beholden to spending two, three months in the NICU in a family medicine residency or whatever, OB. If you're not going to do OB, why should you have to deliver 50 babies? Why should you, you know what I mean? I really think we need to tailor education to the personal interests and the gifts of the person, you know? So I, I have a really important message that I need to get out before we finish which is there's some kind of misunderstanding that doctors have from our systems. Allopathic? You, have, you mean allopathic doctors? Yes. Okay. That you have to like do everything or do a certain number of things to like be a doctor to someone. And that involves things like after hours, phone access, call, paging, hospital privileges, um, uh, procedures, uh, psych med management, controlled substance med management, like there's things that are like required at a company. And my message to all doctors <laughs> contemplating a change is that you can do whatever the flying fuck you want, write it out on a fucking website and offer it up for sale using whatever financial model you desire. And you will, if acting from expertise and your personal best, like your passion, what's right for you, what you're good at, the kind of people that you connect well with and do well with, the conditions, whatever, they will find you and you will find each other. And just because you are unattached to a system, the quality of care is so good that you, it's inevitable that people will tell their grandma and tell their coworker and tell their blah, blah, blah. I've never bought an ad, not one time. Uh -huh. I've never yeah. paid Google. Yeah. I've never paid Facebook. And I kept my overhead low like I was ta taught to. Right. So you get to keep all the money. You know, there's a lot of successful doctors who've been through the course who didn't even open, have a website. They've opened their clinic, they're packed, and they don't even have a website. They never got letterhead or business cards. They just literally said, hi, I'm here. And the floodgates opened and people paid cash. Cash. Yeah. Cash. Cash. They're waiting for you. And yeah. it's really not that expensive. I mean, Pamela helps restructure your brains of like, call around for plumbers hourly rates, call around for lawyers hour hourly rates, call around for web designers hourly rates. How much do you want to charge? And doctors are like, oh, should it be 50? Like, no, it's like yeah. 400 or five. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. The low confidence. Until that feels natural, you come across yeah. weird. So all of this is like energetic where you're coming into a sense of confidence and clarity within yourself, which just uh -huh. takes time. It's not instant. So the things that you liked most about the retreat were the dance party and the soaking. Let's see. The energetic manifestation, clarity, very educational on how to approach life, business and doctoring, empowerment, banishing bullshit, calling it like it is, and business plans and seeing awful looking bedraggled doctors pink up and start smiling. How does that sound? How does that sound to anyone listening? Would you like to pink up and start smiling? Have a good doctor, be a good doctor, be the healer you were born to be? I don't know, Kat, what other points of wisdom do you have for people who are like literally still, I don't know how they're doing this because it was 16 years for me in my own practice. Now I'm retired, but still helping people in a coaching arena, right? But I can't imagine being locked into a big box assembly mind clinic when I've been free for 16 plus years and you've been free for six plus, like seven, seven, seven plus years. Yeah. It's hard to even remember years. the crap that we ingested, but well, there are people that are still stuck there. And what can are. we tell them? What can we tell so them? I, I think of this as like how humans can just get very myopic 
And if you guys think about depression and people who are depressed have this like stuck mindset where I'm a piece of shit, negativity abounds. I don't have what it, I don't have the motivation to do the things to help myself, to make myself feel better. I'm alone. Like loneliness is my reality. You know, even the connection that's trying to get to them can't get to them because so right. If depression healing, part of it is perception shifting from these things that you're thinking and therefore like are real for you to other ways of relating to reality that are like non-depressed. It's the same thing. If you think and have really gotten bought into and had to behave like you believe a lot of lies from corporate medicine, you're in, you're like mentally stuck. So the kind of unstucking, unsticking things, I mean, there's a variety of them going to the woods on a retreat with Pamela that I had the great, great privilege and pleasure of doing was obviously right. It takes you out of your environment. It's in this whole other group. You're doing all these, you're hearing a lot of new inspirational things for days on end. So there are, you will, it's not, it's like not your fault that you're stuck. It's like a natural human neurologic thing to get stuck in. I have to make this exact paycheck. If I go even one day without it, I'm financially fucked. I have to blankety blank, blank, like all of the, I have to's I I understand that you believe those and it will take a shift of perspective. Um, And if you're like, if you, if people don't choose to like liberate themselves and like shift their perspective and see if they can get the garbage out of their brains and start their healing path and start to live their dream then oftentimes something will have to kick them in the pants, like a health problem or like cancer or suicidal ideation or or leaving them their multiple sclerosis. Cause it's not healthy to like live totally out of alignment with your personal ethics. Yeah. So I think that it's really important to get out of your native environment, meet new people, like learn to enjoy the company of other doctors who love their lives. There are many doctors out here who are happy. I, I mean, I would go hang out with happy doctors if you'd like to be a happy doctor, right? Hang out with people who seem to have figured it out like Kat. And yeah, it's just another thing that I've learned, because I used to think that it was just medicine that traumatized us, but I now believe that for most people, the decision to pursue medicine is a trauma response from childhood. What do you think about that? Interesting. You know, I had competitive copycat stuff that spurred my initial interest. Um, And once I made that decision to like try to compete with this friend who I idolized of mine, who had decided to do pre-med in college, we went to the same college. uh, It resonated really strongly with me. And yes, my father was totally emotionally unavailable and depressed when I was a child and my mother went away. (laughs) So I had like no loving person as a eight-year-old on, um, just like a mean, (laughs) large man. And I could reliably get kindness from him with academic achievement. So I got really, you know, focused into like, uh, uh, ach- achievement. So it, it was very, yeah, it's, it is a trauma response of, oh my gosh, I have no value unless I'm successful in these ways. Uh-huh. Right. If I had like gotten a job and made a bunch of money, that wasn't it in our family. It was like academic. We're not family for him, for my, for my dad. So yeah, it is a weird, like personality thing of, uh, fortunately I am completely and utterly obsessed with health and wellness. And I am my, like my, my work, it's like, it pays me to do what I naturally obsess about constantly in my mind, like all day and all night and like all of my dreams. Yeah. You're on a perpetual vacation, basically that's called you own your own practice and you can think and do and 
and and write about and and learn about a topic that absolutely fascinates you that you can help others i mean what is how what is better i think everyone who goes into medicine especially primary care psych related has the same dream they just don't have the structure and the mentorship to pull it off so i guess my Last little bit of advice is I would encourage people, if you're not blissed out by your job, please uh, redirect, reroute uh, your GPS and find some mentors because uh, we're out here and you don't have to suffer, you know, you do not. Have and I stand, I stand firmly by Pamela's like, isn't it one-on-one? You have like a one-on-one course. Yeah, I mean, it's on demand now. So it's like 20 hours of MP3 audio that you could just download and listen to yeah. over and over and over again. And you will brainwash yourself out yes. of the bullshit. I am only here, like, I re-brainwashed myself with, I am intelligent, educated, motivated, loving, and can be creative. And here's a bunch of options. Ready? One, two, three, go. And I'm like, what? And it just worked. I, I also know that I was less depressed and traumatized because of how little time I spent in training. So I'm not surprised. And I went to 10 in-person retreats of Pamela's. You know, after we do the fire ceremony so many times, you have nothing left to throw in the fire. You know what I mean? It's the fire ceremony to throw away your pain and suffering. And it even surprised me after a number of treats, I had nothing left in me that was negative or painful because um, we were able to discard it in a community of supportive healers that in the end, even the people who thought they hated doctors loved these people. And yeah. Like when I think back to some of the doctors in training who were really, really uncomfortable, like basically hated me. I have a big personality. So like I attract people who hate me. I can only feel compassion for them and know that they're, fucking life kind of sucked. Like I'm sure they like parts of it, but like it is not a good life to be faculty at an academic institution. I mean, there's good parts to it, but it's painful in other respects. And I'm not fucking surprised that my free spirit irked her or them or whatever, because those are parts of themselves that they have fucking castrated off is like the free yeah. spirit. And they're like yeah. following in line with academics. And so it, it's beautiful to now I look back on her, I'm thinking of this one woman's face and I'm just like, you were an amazing teacher and you were so fucking mean to me. And I can see why yeah. it doesn't hurt me. Yeah. I think a lot of the friction is between entrepreneurs and employees. Like employees have a natural sort of, I don't know, animosity, jealousy towards those who are just completely free and are making great money and can do whatever they want, you know? So I think that's where I've gotten into a lot of trouble with a, some subset of physicians who have trouble with me because being a free spirit, an entrepreneur with no needs to be in a box can rub people the wrong way if they're trapped. And then to be a truth speaker is really like, wow, like that's very uh, unusual these days to be able to speak the truth about taboo topics, you know, and really keep an open mind. High and empathy in a time of divisiveness is yeah. really an interesting pursuit. What were you gonna say? You know, I just wanna like, you know this, I guess, peripherally, but the joy and fascination I get from doctoring or whatever that is, like thinking through really complicated, weird problems, all of which have tons of psych and emotional overlay. Everyone's health problems are like, ugh. Mm -hmm. And teasing that out and addressing that with my tools and thoughtfulness and time is so endlessly fascinating and nourishing. I mean, Pamela, I'm pushing for both of you. You have an artisan type practice. It's a one of a kind. That's the other thing that I want to tell doctors is like when you're living your dream and your soul's purpose, nobody can replicate it. Like you, like there's nobody in the world that has another clinic like yours because nobody else is Cat Lopez and nobody can do it your way, you know? And I just want people to know nobody can steal your dream except you. You can steal your birthright of your dream by submitting to a culture that is killing you. There is no way that I could be realized in this way, all of this without like buying in to your methods, your live your dream one-on-one -on -one methods. It's like, 
trauma healing and like dream up the best thing and reactivate your confidence and what lights you up, your slogans, the no bullshit. Like there's no way. And I just, it's not just like, it's not a job. It's not work. You have that quote about like indistinguishing play and work. It's like Uh a... Eastern right. philosophy. Yeah. If you really made it, if you can no longer distinguish your work from your play, mm-hmm. this is my, my life of thinking thoughtfully and working with the emotional over and spiritual overlay of health and wellness is so is endlessly fascinating and gives me this daily experience of love between this person who's totally unique and different from me and different from the last person and gender and age and everything. And I like, it's, I could, I couldn't, there's no better thing that I, I'm like on top of the fucking world. There's no better. I'm, I I feel almost embarrassed about what I get to do. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And it's hard. And it's like being able to do what you love to do and getting paid for it, like getting paid to basically be on vacation healing people and learning like com- you know what i call cme you know complete uh, medical empowerment you know you are in a zone of complete medical empowerment where you are a lifetime learner and you're getting paid to learn and help these beautiful vulnerable people who trust you and I couldn't be happier for you, Kat. I'm and so I glad you're not just roaming the <laughs> roaming around peddling pharmaceuticals from your trunk. I knew you had more in you than that. And I like the where I chose to have my office a couple years ago. Like I, it, this amazing Pilates studio is across the street, so I go to Pilates and yoga like twice a day because it's like across the street. I'm like a picture of all I have the best time. I have this little Pilates community right there everything I could want. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Kat, is there any help that you need from me? Do you have any questions? I feel like you've really got it made and you've figured out the fortune cookie of your life. But if you have any coaching questions, I am friggin' happy to answer anything for you live. Oh, oh, you know, is there any problem that you're having with your practice that I can answer? Because Oh my God, I should have prepped. I'm sure I could fucking think of something. Well, if you want, you can write a whole list of questions. We can have another little mini session, a 10 minute session at some point. You just let me know. I'm so like dreamy and like focused on how great everything yeah, yes. is. I can't come up with anything. Um, but of course, of course, I have small issue. It, I guess my la- for your for your interest. I mean, you probably know this, but my romantic relationship with my partner feels so loving and healthy and solid. I never knew what that was like until him. I didn't know I could have that. I thought I was too much of a drama queen. So that those pieces of my life feeling so good is like impossible. I'm being gifted for some incredible feat of martyrdom in a past life <laughs> with getting to have that. It's yeah. crazy town. And I, I could die a happy woman tomorrow. Like, Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, if you hadn't broken out of the sort of assembly line big box thing, you probably wouldn't able, wouldn't have been able to manifest that relationship, I would guess, because how can you do how can you manifest a beautiful romantic relationship if you're charting till midnight on the weekends? And like feel like you're doing a bad job. Who wants to feel like they're doing a bad job every day? And that you could be reprimanded on Monday morning because something that's you just, depressing. You yeah. You have to feel like you're doing a good job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations, Kat. You are in an orgasmic state professionally and personally.